All right, guys, looks like we are live and ready to rock and roll. So welcome to 10% Fitter Method workshop number 19. This is workshop number 19 out of 25 that I'm releasing. And if you don't know, I'm doing this to honor the memory of my father who passed away 25 years ago this year from living in an unsustainable way. So to honor him, I'm doing this and also educating you in the process. But we're going to cover macros today. So before I jump into administrative stuff and talk about you know who sponsors us, let's quickly jump into agenda and we'll discuss understanding the three macronutrients. I'll talk about what they are and you know pretty common knowledge but a little bit more detail about what it is and how macros vary for different goals. Right, whether you're trying to lose weight, maintain, or gain muscle, um, we want to see how that shifts as far as our macros go. And then we'll talk about three stages of macro planning. Basically, level one, level two, and level three of what level you're at and what you should be focused on. So let's now cover real quick some of the administrative stuff. And first of all, the show is sponsored by Perspective Force. You see there in bottom left corner, PerspectiveForce.com. It's a corporate coaching company that basically helps companies to bring the human being to the center of their competitive advantage. We help people to thrive within the walls of organizations by bringing all eight major umbrellas of coaching under one roof, under one system, one aligned process to uh, basically optimize the investment for our clients and get them more for the return. From there, we want to see, right, I'm Coach Anton, I'm a healthy life coach, you know, I own Perspective Force, I'm a, you know, partner, I should say not own, I'm a partner in it, and I'm also a healthy life coach. That's something that I do on the side, outside of Perspective Force, and within Perspective Force as well. Then, ultimately, we're trying to get fitter. 10% fitter is not about doing more push-ups or more sit-ups or looking thinner. Sure, those are great things, but the new level of fitness has to do with something else. Fitter for us is about being forward-thinking, intrinsically motivated, tenaciously passionate, trusting in self, emotionally intelligent, and most importantly, resilient to external. When people are truly healthy, they realize that health is the vehicle to their thriving life and, and business. It's not a destination. And when you realize that you start using it properly, you can reach that level of fitness as well. So let's dive into macronutrients. First one to cover is going to be carbohydrates, right? That's the one that's probably been under the most attack and most talked about these days because everybody thinks that carbohydrates you know, are the devil. Well, let's take a look. Are they really the devil? All right. I don't know if you've seen the movie, I think it's called Waterboy with Adam Sandler, where he's a uh He's working with a football team and he's their water boy and helps them out with different things like that. And he has this mom who's really crazy and she believes that everything is the devil. So anytime she says something, oh, science is this, she just goes, that's the devil. So that's the joke, why the joke came, carbs are the devil. No, they're not the devil. They really are not. And I'll explain why that is. So carbohydrate sources, right? What are those carbohydrate sources? You can see there on the screen, it's a variety. Some will come from fruits, some will come from vegetables, some will come from grains. You may even get some from seeds, very little, right? Um, but there's many different sources and there's good carbs, there's bad carbs. I've talked about this a lot over the past, but let's take a look at some of the things here, right? So four calories per gram. This is going to be important when we discuss understanding how much you should be eating in order to understand how your macros work, right? Um, mostly plant-based, right? Majority of carbohydrates are going to be plants plant-based. Um, high X, I think it's like I'm trying to think, well, I guess dairy, all right? If you're going, well, it doesn't have carbohydrates. Dairy is an example, right? That comes from a cow, but it does have carbs in it. Um, high impact on blood sugar. You know, relatively speaking, compared to fats and proteins, carbohydrates have a very high impact on blood sugar. That means they're going to spike blood sugar. Uh, how much they spike is going to be determined by what kind of carbohydrate it is. And we've talked about that in a previous workshop with blood sugar regulation. But we know smart carbs, the complex carbs is what we should be focused on. They help to build muscle. Believe it or not, carbohydrates are very needed for muscular production. I'm sure we can build muscle like we should be able to. It's very tough to build muscle on no carbohydrates. Your body needs that insulin increase in order to go into muscle building mode, into that anabolic hormone. So make sure that you understand, don't try to starve your body from carbs, especially if you're trying to perform. Carbs are not the devil. They're a quick energy, right? Comparing to a protein and comparing to a fat, they're a quick energy. Within carbohydrates, the complexity of that carbohydrate will determine also how much quicker it is or how much slower it is. But in, ge in general terms, relatively speaking, comparing to the other two macronutrients, they're very quick energy. They're usually just chain molecules, right? You break one bond, you make very fast and easy energy. That's why when you're stressed, your body wants carbohydrates, whether it be sweet, salty, crunchy, doesn't matter. It wants something simple to get back into its system because it's burning through so much of that quick fuel to, because of the stress that you're in. So 
from there, it's minimal storage, right? Your body can't store a ton of carbohydrates in your body. Depending on the size of a person, somewhere between 300 to 400 you know, grams that we can store in our system. That's not a ton. If you're exercising intensely, you can burn through that in an hour, really at the high intensity, maybe two hours. Um, and then you crash out. Fat is a little bit different. It's more complex. We'll talk about that in a sec, but just know, minimal storage of carbohydrates. If you're using carbs for fuel, you have to replenish it regularly, right? In order to be able to sustain that performance. But but you need blood sugar in order to do everything in the body. So that's really, really important. You can get blood sugar from other places. It's not necessary to eat carbs, but you should because they do make you perform better and they are good for you in proper amounts, proper ratios, and proper types of carbohydrates. So from there, let's dive into protein. Protein is kind of the next big thing that everybody talks about, how much protein they should be eating. There's a lot of you know debate that people say, oh, eating too much protein is bad for your kidneys. Guys, before you hear some hoopla like that out there that tells you that, understand that protein is not bad for you. Um, what usually is the case is when you have um, issues with like kidneys and things like that before you start to increase your protein you could be in danger of you know being able to or be, being causing issues to your kidneys from having too much protein but if you don't have a pre-existing condition eating too much protein is not going to be a problem um will your body absorb it all no absolutely not i'm not saying that that's what you should do we're going to talk about percentages here in a second but just understand that protein is not going to hurt you eating a lot of protein is not bad for you it's a myth that somebody likes to push out out there so let's get into the you know sources and things like that and what are different components so it's essential in nine ways, and we're going to explain that in a sec, but let's take a look at protein. Look at the different sources there in the top left corner. You have your meats, which everybody's pretty familiar, right? We know that meat and protein go hand in hand, but you don't have to eat meat to get enough protein. Guys, I'm not advocating for being vegan or vegetarian. I'm not saying that, but if you are, and that's your choice, there's still no excuse not to get enough protein. It's tougher, it's harder, it's not as good quality, but you still can. Guys, I've discussed this veganism and, and vegetarianism many times, but I'll cover it one more time. If that's a spiritual belief and you're doing it because that's something you wanna do for yourself uh, because of certain belief system that you may have, that's totally fine. Like that, There's no problem with that whatsoever. But if you're doing it because you think it's the healthiest thing to do, that's wrong. It is wrong science. You've been fooled by some bad research. The best thing for you to do is eat a lot of vegetables and eat some clean meat. Um, so don't necessarily try to avoid it thinking you're doing yourself a good, good service. Um, from there, let's kind of break it down. So essential amino acids for the body to function. There's nine amino acids that our body needs. And this is over 20 of them that our body uses, but nine of them are specifically for the system that our body can't produce on its own. So it has to get it from an alternative source. We have to eat something that our body then breaks down into these amino acids and it can use it for all sorts of different things in our body. And that's what protein is for, amino acids. Combination of plant and animal based. Like I said, you can get great protein sources from plant based proteins. Tougher, not as complete, but still can find combinations to get yourself complete profiles. Um, low, low impact on blood sugar, right? Protein doesn't really spike blood sugar a ton. It does a little bit because your body's able to get glucose, blood sugar, from protein. It can break it down through a process called gluconeogenesis, and which is why your body will eat your muscle when it needs glucose. It can break your muscle down to try to get glucose to feed the brain and feed all the other activities for energy production. So starving yourself and, and avoiding carbs too much is not always a good idea, guys. Everybody's all about keto, but it's, it, keto is just a tool, guys. It's not a complete system, so be careful. I've talked about that in the past. Um, helps to build muscle, right? We all kind of know protein helps to build muscle because of those amino acids. They give our body the building blocks. That's the most important thing. From your protein, you get the bricks to build what the house that you need, the foundation that you need, right? The structure that you need. Um, they're not ideal for energy. Like I said, you shouldn't be relying for protein for energy. It's not a it's not a good process. Usually we're deficient that our body goes there. So don't necessarily, you know, advise it. And then similar to carbohydrates, four calories per gram. That's where we're looking at protein. So lots of different recommendations, right? If you're looking to bodybuild, like in general, I usually tell people if you were just to focus on one thing with your diet and looking at macros, shoot for a gram of your goal body weight per day, right? So if you want to weigh 150 pounds, try to shoot for 150 grams of protein per day. Um, and, and in so many ways, it's going to adjust so many different things with that singular focus. Uh, because in, in general, I've talked about this a lot. Don't avoid carbs, chase protein as an example. If you wanted to lose some weight, don't put a negative into your head saying, I'm not going to do this and then end up screwing it up because you went for it for some reason. So 
from there, let's take a look at the last one, which is gonna be fats, right? For the longest time, we thought fat was evil, right? You eat fat. We had very common sense kind of science, right? And it was common sense. So if I eat a lot of fat, my body's just gonna store a lot of fat. We had a very linear equation in our minds, but the system does not work that well or in that way. I'm gonna talk about metabolism in the next workshop and cardio and explain all that, but just understand it's not a linear process. Just because you eat a lot of fat doesn't mean your body's gonna store a lot of fat. It's actually the other way around. If you give your body a lot of fat, your body will burn a lot of fat because your body sees, your body is a survivor, your body is amazing. It'll do some things that you would never imagine to survive what you're throwing at it. So if you give it something in the fuel source in a much higher abundance, it's gonna say, you know what? I'm getting so much of it, let me use it more. And I'll cover this in metabolism again, but just a quick, quick conversation. At any given time, as you're exercising or you're sitting still, there's a certain percentage of carbohydrates that's being used to fuel you and a certain percentage of fat. Remember, with limited in carbs, fuel, fat we have forever, right? Or many, many days. So we want the body to pull much higher percentage from fats than carbohydrates. If we eat more fat, body naturally does that. We'll talk about metabolism and things, things like that, how to do it more in the next workshop, how to shift your fat metabolism. So with fat, one of the biggest things that it's important for you is 60% of your brain is, cons is, is made from fat. So think about it. If you don't have, if you're building blocks, your brain is made of this stuff and you don't provide enough of it, like many people that go on low fat diets, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing's good is going to happen, right? So fats are not the devil. It's, it's just like the carbohydrates. They're not bad. Nine calories per gram, much more complex. That's why fat is a much more slower energy uh, molecule. It takes a lot of times to break it down. The scientific fact is it takes about 35% of energy from the fat molecule itself just to break it down, right? So to break that fat component down, we have to spend 35% energy to do that. And this is where we've talked about, you know, we'll talk about metabolism again, but in the past, that heat factor, right? How much of thermogenic energy your body's producing because you're eating a lot of complex things or your body's having to expend a lot of energy to get it. It's not an immediate source of carbohydrate. Um, it's plant and animal based. We know we have our uh, saturated fats, which is gonna be predominantly, you know, uh, animal-based, and then you have your unsaturated fats, which is going to be predominantly plant-based. We want to focus more on the healthy fats. We don't want to have a lot of bad fats. Bad fats are going to be your man-made fats, the trans fats, the hydrogenated fats. Those are going to wreak havoc in your system. Healthy fats are not bad for you. Your body needs it. They're going to make you feel amazing. It's going to make your brain feel good, make your hormones be produced properly. So like you see here, helps with brain and health hormone production. The other one is there's no impact on blood sugar. Your body can be fueled by fat from ketones and you actually can survive on it because your body has a different energy system that it does through fat than it does through uh, carbohydrates. It's a slow release energy, right? Something that, that's why with, when we eat fat, we're gonna talk about this in a second with basic meal planning or macro structuring, at every meal, you should be having a fat source. Never have a meal with no fat source, at, at bare minimum. In uh, abundant storage, right? We carry, even thin people can still have days of fat in their body. Overweight people have even more than that. So understand that it's a very, very long-term storage. So macros for different goals, right? This is ultimately what you're probably listening to this workshop for and, and what you're looking for. Um, what do these macros break down to? How do they, you know, what do they look? What should they look like for different goals? Because as you adjust your goals, you should adjust your caloric intake. You should also adjust where those calories are coming from. It's cal we've long ago realized this, but if you don't, a calorie is not a calorie. All calories are not made even. So back in the day when like Weight Watchers came around, they used to treat it that way and everything was even. Then they said, okay, let's get a little bit more creative. They got a little bit more creative. Now they're WW brand is saying they're customizing stuff. It's bogus, guys. Weight Watchers is such complete garbage. Please don't waste your time on that. I will gladly help you out in different ways and teach you self sustainment. Weight Watchers does not teach good information. Bottom line, period. Um, anyway, beside the point. So what you guys are waiting for is these specific macro ratios. This is what 10% fitter believes in, right? After doing research, science, and you know, over a decade of working with clients, this is what we believe in. Does that mean that it's the only thing out there? No, there's, there's variances in this. There is, in general, going to be some similarities from one program to the next, from one system to the next, but with 10% fitter, this is our bread and butter. So if somebody's going to maintain, means that they're just in general diet, just eating healthy for the most part, what that should look like is 30% protein, 35% carbs, 35% fat. So meaning out of your total day, 
if you break down all of your calories and you factor the four and the four and the nine calorie breakdown per gram, you should see this kind of thing happening. Now, am I telling you to make it precise? No. And I'm going to explain the need for precision as we go through progressions of different levels of macro clients and your understanding of macros. So understand that that's maintenance. If you're trying to see how many calories you should be eating, what we do for a very basic understanding of maintenance is your resting metabolism, which we basically say your body weight times 10. I'm going to cover a little bit of different formula for you here in the next um, slide or a couple slides ahead. I can't remember where it is. Uh, but in general, we use an estimate, just 10 times your body weight. And then you're going to add your daily activity level somewhere between 200 to 500 calories per day, depending on how active you are. If you are a construction worker, you're adding 500. If you're you know, sitting around a lot and you're not moving a lot, you're only adding 200 because you're not really doing that much excess, uh, extra activity. So the point here is we should break even in the amount of calories we consumed versus the amount of calories we expended. Ballpark, not exact measurement. I'll explain that in a sec. Then if we want to build muscle, right, we're trying to increase our muscle. For one, our calories are going to be different, right? So you see the same thing that you had before, resting metabolism, which is body weight times 10, and then plus daily activity, which is that 200 to 500 calories. But then we're going to add another 500 to 1,000 calories. And this depends on if you want a clean bulk, dirty bulk, right? If you want to bulk up and add muscle fast with a little bit of excess fat, or if you want to add muscle slow and not gain excess fat, right? So somewhere in that sweet spot is which we're going to shoot for for calories. As far as macronutrient breakdown goes, we are going to go much heavier on carbs and much lower on fat. Protein, we're keeping the same across the board. I actually keep protein the same across the board because it varies in the amount of protein because total calories are smaller. So it still changes the number, but from percentage standpoint, 30% across the board. So 50% carbs, we want a lot of glycogen. We want a lot of insulin. We want a lot of full muscles happening, right? So we also want a lot of carbs coming from calories in that standpoint. And then only 20% fat. Fat is not that important for muscle building. It really is not. So that's why we decrease the fat, increase the carbs, and that's where the calories break down. Now you want to lose weight. Many of you may be in this category. You may be going, I actually want to break down and lose weight instead of you know gaining weight or maintaining weight. So in this scenario, you're going to keep protein the same again, right? 30%. But now we're going to go much higher in fat. Why? Because with fat or with weight loss, the most important thing is blood sugar regulation. So we need to stop some of the excess carbs to prevent the spikes from happening. And then the fat to get the body to use fat more for fuel instead of blood sugar, which makes also that blood sugar last longer. So understand there's exact science for everything that we do within 10% fitter. And that's what we break down with losing weight. So 30% protein, 20% carbs, 50% fat. In general, guys, you usually you're going to have higher carb, lower fat, or higher fat, lower carb. Never be high in both. And generally speaking, you wouldn't be low in both because who wants to eat that much protein? Um, but as far as your caloric intake goes, it's just your resting metabolism. So we're not acting at daily activity level. Why? Because we want to be in a deficit for the day. Guys, I don't care who you talk to. You can't beat physics. If you're eating more calories per day than you're burning – not going to happen, right? So we need to be eating less. Calculating that is complex. So we're going by estimates, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But just understand, your resting metabolism times 10, that's all you're eating. So that's the general breakdown that we practice within 10% fitter method and how we go about it. Hey, Colin, what's going on, brother? Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Actually, this is from Precision Nutrition, man. I, it's not mine. I wouldn't claim it. I got certified through them, so I took a lot of their stuff. Um, so from here, we get into why do we not believe in weighing food? This is the first thing they got to break you down from. Before I teach you why 10% fitter method does what we do and why I preach what I preach, I need you to take away from your current belief, right? Because if I don't break this down in your head, you're still going to think you need to count calories and you still need to be precise and all that kind of stuff. So let's look at why calories in, how we count them is ineffective. So we shouldn't be doing it the traditional method. And what am I talking about traditional method? Scales, those kind of things, measuring everything. It's, it's not precise. So here's uh, part number one, while calorie counts are imprecise. So look at apples, carrots, and tomatoes. And this happens with every food. Every food is different. So you look at the same size apple, one medium apple. You can have one be 83 calories, one be 93 calories, and one be 116 calories. 
it varies. The nutrients that apple tree got, the sunlight, the, the, the environment, the you know, you name so many different variables that could happen that impact how many calories that apple has in it. Carrots, anywhere from 36 to 70, 61 calories. Um, chopped tomatoes, anywhere from 23 to 49 calories. So an error of up to 50% when people are making these measurements. You cut the same amount, you weigh the same amount, but what it actually contains has up to 50% variance. Yet people are going and measuring everything out, stressing themselves out, spending precious time Time on things that don't matter. Uh, from there is another point on food labels, right? So you're going, well, food labels got to be accurate, right? They measure everything. Nope, because food companies may use any of five different methods to estimate, keyword estimate calories. So the FDA permits inaccuracies of up to 20%. Here you are measuring everything, trying to get everything right, eating half an almond to get your right amount of fat in, and it's already up to 20% variance. It's crazy. Don't do it, guys. I'll give you four more if that's not enough. Here's another two reasons. So reason number two, we don't absorb all of the calories we consume. So one is a really known factor. So there's actually in protein 5.65 calories, but we only absorb four. In fat, there's 9.45 calories, we only absorb nine. And in carbs, there's 4.10 calories, we absorb four. So not all of that gets absorbed, but that's a common knowledge. But here's the more important knowledge. This is what's actually happened. All nutrients absorb differently. So as an example, the formula doesn't work for nuts and seeds because we absorb fewer calories from them than calculated. So only 68% of almonds are absorbed. Only 79% of walnuts are absorbed. And 95% of pistachios are absorbed. Are you there calculating all that out that precisely? No, you're not. Nobody can. It's not, it's not really possible, right? So then all these other things that you can see from the way that we cook, right? From amount of, oh, sorry, this one is amount of fiber that we have. So you can see that amount of fiber varies the amount of absorption. So 17 more calories are absorbed in tomatoes. 28 more calories are absorbed in kale. 21% more absorbed in calories absorbed in, in cabbage. And you can see across the board different things like that, but error of 10%. So now we're looking at even more error occurring, right? And we're only gone through two. Here's two more for you. Um, next, we got level three is how you prepare food changes its caloric load. Is that something you're also calculating when you think you need to be measuring calories? So take a look at it. A raw egg, 47 calories. A boiled egg, 74 calories. A raw meat, 196 calories. That steak, once you cooked it, cooked it, went up to 240. The potato, 101 calories. Once you cooked it, especially if you like baked it, 193 calories, right? Because there's not a bunch of resistant starch that comes from potatoes like when we boil them. So the point is they're up to 90%. The other thing, individuals absorb calories uniquely, right? We've talked about gut health in a previous workshop and explained to you guys how your gut health, the amount of bacteria living in your gut determines how well you absorb food or how well you don't absorb food. And yours is different than mine and mine is different from somebody else's. And it's almost like a unique fingerprint. It's so it's a very unique imprint that we all have and it constantly changes. So how are you gonna figure out what percentage you're able to absorb? So as an example, people with a higher portion of um, Firmicutes bacteria absorb an average of 150 calories per day more than those with a higher proportion of bacteroides. I can't say that, sorry guys. Break my break my English second language tongue. Uh, but the point is, once again, how do you know what's going on there? How much you're actually pulling in? So how can you measure your calories in that accurately? You can't, that's the points that I'm making to you. And the last one is gonna be focused on people aren't great at eyeballing portion sizes, right? Look at the example of a tablespoon or a teaspoon, big difference, right? 94% variance, you know, a, a bowl of something, a cup of something, a slice, right? So many variances that occur, yet somebody tells you, give me a bunch of money so I can figure out how for you to count macros so I can give you your perfect body. Bullshit, guys, it doesn't work like that. These are charlatans, and then don't get me wrong, some of them truly believe this, because they don't understand this part of it. They don't understand the calories in, calories out equation is not that simple, and there's a lot of variables that we can't control and measure, ever. Period. Um, so th from there, let's get into the last piece and we'll finish up. But this is three stages of macro planning. So, right, we understand that when you walk into a gym and you come in into a gym environment and you're going, okay, I want to get fit. Do you walk up to a squat rack and grab, load the bar up 300 pounds and start throwing it over your head real fast? No, you're going to kill yourself. For one, you probably can't do it. For two, you're going to kill yourself. 
because you have a common understanding in your head that there is a proper level of progression that I should be doing with movement and exercise. But what makes you think that level of progression doesn't apply to nutrition? What makes you think that level of progression does not apply to your macronutrients? It absolutely does. So if you've never paid attention to macronutrients, if you're just eating whatever you, you're on a seafood diet, meaning that whatever you see you eat um, right now, then what makes you think you're gonna go from that to meal prep, food measuring, all this kind of stuff? No, basics first. Master the basics, then move on to the next stage. Then move on to the final stage. So there's three stages, specific stages of macro planning. This is really my clients. Like I come in, I was actually, actually just talking to one of my clients and I was like, yeah, you're really kind of getting down level one. And she's like, oh, level one. I was like, but here's what level two and level three looks like. Um, so I really look at my clients that way and we apply specific things depending on the stage that they're in. They gotta be ready for this stuff. So stage one, right? This is very basic things. So if you are eating seafood diet, meaning you see food, you eat it, um, this is what you want to focus on initially. Get a protein, a fat, and a fiber at every meal. Before you worry about counting calories and doing all that stuff, can you just simply make sure that every snack, every meal, you're getting a source of a protein, a source of fat, and a source of a fiber? And you'd be amazed by just shifting towards that simple focus, how many positive effects would happen in your life. Instead of preoccupying your brain with all these different changes, all the different things, just get this one thing down. That's the rule for every meal or a snack. And then follow that plate philosophy, right? So make your plate look something like this. We're about half of it are your veggies. We got, you know, about a, you know, the other half quarter of it or so is going to be um, fats. The other half quarter are going to be starches. And the other, you know, half half is going to be proteins. Make sure you get some water or tea and maybe a little bit of fruit for dessert if you need it. That's not necessary. But the point is, can you get it to look like this as the next phase, right? So you're now getting a protein, a fiber, and a fat, and now we're actually looking at portion control in a way. So we're kind of doing some macronutrient breakdown by simply looking at our plate and how we divide that plate up. Master this. Once you get this down, then you're allowed to go to the next phase and not worry about you know failing or not worry about relapsing and trying to change too much at once. So that's the important stage one. For stage two, we're gonna progress into something different. Now, we need to understand your estimated caloric intake. So I'm gonna show you guys here some resting metabolism stuff and how to calculate this. And it's still a ballpark, guys. We're still estimating. And then you go by palm portions. So then you measure with palm portions and you set up yourself a daily tracker for the week. You can see there, Monday through Sunday, you have your protein portions, your vegetable portions, your carb portions, and your fat portions. This is my actual one. If I ever you know, get really focused, I don't typically do this, guys. I'm not saying I'm that dialed in. When I am, when I need to, right? Summer's getting ready and summer's close and I'm maybe not as good enough of a shape as I wanna be, I may get a little bit more dialed in. But this is not necessarily what I do all the time. I do more of a general diet. Um, but anyway, so I track this. I know exactly what I should be having per meal, what I should be having per day, and I track my total for the day and I see how I did and how, how where I should be, right? So I should be eating seven protein portions per day. I should be eating six to eight vegetable por uh, portions per day. I should be eating 10 portions of carbs and 11 portions of fats based on my size, my goals, and the things that we talked about. This is how they'll pay, uh, plays out. So calculating all this, right? So here we're gonna look as a simple breakdown. Say I went with, I'm a 160 pound person. I'm not, I'm 200 pounds, but just number on the board that I just threw up. Times 10, what does that tell us? It gives us a gross estimate and a caloric uh, daily need. So this is gonna be a person that is say losing weight, right? We're not adding in anything. They're just basically on a weight loss program, uh, program, but they're not trying to lose a ton. They're only losing a few pounds. So maybe their macros are more like this, right? Just a little bit higher fat content, but not too much, and a little bit more carbs, but still on a lower side, right? So now we're gonna calculate, before we figure out how many palm portions we need, we need to see how many grams of every macronutrient we need that fits into the percentages that fits into our total caloric need. So from 1600 calories daily, we're gonna see what 40% of that is, what 30% of it is, and what 30% of it is. And then convert it based on the grammage per calorie, or, or, or I should say calories per gram. So with first one, we're looking at fat, right? So we got 1600 times 40%, divided by nine, nine grams per, or nine calories per carb, gives us 71 grams of fat daily. 1600, same thing, blah, 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 gives us 120 grams of carbs daily and 120 grams of protein daily. Why are these numbers the same? Because they're the same percentages of carbs and protein. That's why they're the same. From there, now I need to convert it into palm portions. So in here, you can see how that breaks down. One palm is somewhere between 20 and 30 grams. So what I did then is I took, um, 
and, and divided that number. So say I have 120 or 71 grams of fat daily. I divide that by fat, which is about uh, seven to 12 grams, I went with 10. So that's why you see me dividing by 10 up here and we get seven thumbs of fat daily. I need to eat this much seven times of fat per day. About, not, is this an exact measurement? No, it's not, it's a ballpark, but it's much easier, it's actually better for you than counting and measuring calories. So from there, same thing for carbohydrates, same thing for protein. So I get with five cup hands of carbs and five palms of protein daily. So these are your breakdowns. I kind of go in the middle, right? So with macronutrients for proteins, I go divided by maybe 25. With uh, carbs, same thing, divided by 25, and the fats divided by 10. And it gives you a ballpark estimation, and then you can put it into action. So this is my personal meal plan, like I just mentioned, right? This is what it all breaks down with some sources for each one and what I should focus on. And it's simple, it's doable. It's something that I can still stay focused, still stay highly aware of what I'm putting in my body, but I'm not increasing my stress load of having to measure, weigh, carry my weight scale with me on a road and all this nonsense that people do. Now, is there a time and a place for that? Yes, because the, I would say, and this is just a, it's not a study, this is just my experience. The level of improvement between palm portion measuring and actually weighing everything and measuring everything out is about 10 to 20 percent, right? The workload that it takes is about 50 percent. So the increase in workload is much higher than the reward. That's why I say for average people don't go there. But if you're a bodybuilder, if you need to get to this highest level performance level, you're a high level athlete. Yes, then you need to do the extra 50% of work to get that 10, 20% improvement because you have to squeeze out every margin of performance possible from every source. If nutrition is one, you have to squeeze it out. Most people, 95% of people out there don't have to worry about it. So most of you that are buying macros from people and weighing the shit, stop wasting your time, guys. There's so many other places that you can invest your time and attention and stress into that will get you a lot more results than, than measuring all this out. All right, so this is the last piece. This is your stage three client. You're measured your metabolism, right? And I'm gonna talk about metabolism in the next slide, but you've truly calculated your metabolism. Here's the thing, guys. If you're measuring everything, you're doing everything, and even if that side is perfect, how do you know exactly how much you need if you haven't calculated your metabolism perfectly? You know how to do that? It's super expensive. They put you into a room but it's a controlled environment. They're measuring everything in that room. And they measure your caloric burn by changing, by seeing how much the atmosphere changes by you being in there. It has to do with oxygen consumption. You know, the other one is gonna be where they hook you up to an oxygen mask and you know, my old company used to do and they claim it to be effective. It's only like 45% effectiveness. So there you go, already a bunch of inefficiency that could occur. And the last one is a formula. Many of these people go with a formula and then they build these macros. So hopefully you're seeing, it's very ineffective to calculate the total amount of calories a person Person should be eating. It's very ineffective to see how many calories you're taking in and how many they're expending. So yet people try to build you these formulas and say, this is the truth. This is the formula. This is the answer to all your problems. No, it's not. It is not. It's just a gimmick that makes sense logically. But when you take a look and really deep dive, you see that the logic is <clears throat> very surface level, very common sense logic, but it's not science back logic. So guys, that's it with macros. Macros are important, guys. I'm not going to say they're not. But the way you measure and the way you count them is very different from what people will tell you traditionally. So hopefully this helps you out to understand a little bit. Um, this was workshop number 19. We got metabolism and cardio workshop number 20. And then we got five more left after that. Remember, workshop 25 will be how to put all of this into action. Because I've been memory dumping you, information dumping on you for a long time now. And it's supposed to be that way. If it feels a little overwhelming, it's supposed to be that way. You're just supposed to be journaling all through this process, experiencing all these different things. And then what's going to happen? When you start to put it into action, you're going to know all these experiences. You're going to say, okay, what is my highest impact, lowest effort thing that I journaled about that I'm going to start with? to build my winning momentum once I start to implement that within the 25% method of 10% fitter, sorry, 10% fitter method, the 25 workshops of implementing them of how to actually put it into action, right? How do I go step by step? Because I've made you change over the last, you know, oh, what is it, eight, nine weeks or something like that. So many different things. That's not 10% fitter method. I memory dumped the information dump to teach you and get you asking better questions. But workshop 25 will be now let's back it up, slow it down, apply with habits and consistency to make small but mighty changes that create massive results for you. All right, guys, thanks so much for checking this out. Have a great day.